welcome everybody it's it's lovely um to see some faces i can see partially on the screen having shared my slides um but i just wanted to um you know welcome you all we've we've been doing this is the third talk in um in a series we're doing at the ou called design at 50 which is really celebrating um, 50 years of design teaching, as it says, um, at the European University. And it's, I guess, pretty unusual for um, higher education institutions to have footage from 50 years ago of people talking about anything, but in this case, design. So we're quite fortunate, I suppose, to be able to delve into our archive and think about some of the things that are being talked about and actually perhaps reflect on how some of the stuff they're talking about is still very relevant today. Some of it's moved on, um, perhaps surprisingly not enough of it's moved on. Um, but we thought we'd we'd title this one, uh, or have a theme around sort of climate emergency, um, design for sustainability, just because that's our research interest amongst us here today. But the fact we think that it's a really important area for design to um, continue to be engaged with um, the relationship between people, planet, technology, our material, culture, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the things that I think we were talking about um, 50 years ago and we're still trying to teach and research about today. And perhaps more importantly, we've moved on to also trying to act as well as teach. And the relationship between action and teaching maybe is, is becoming closer. So... Um, I'm not going to spend ages talking about the slides, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what we're planning. We're going to focus on um, a course called T262, Man-Made Futures. Not, not <laughs> notice the man bit. It was 1975, but um, it was a second level course and it was part of um, the technology faculty at the time. And... I guess as it is today, design was seen in a very interdisciplinary way at the Open University. Um, and you can see that through the sorts of discussions that were happening around that time. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about three areas, design for sustainability, um, looking at futures and assumptions and values, and also the importance of um, perhaps creativity and creative thinking in helping us reframe or frame aspects of climate um, and, you know, I think we'd like the conversation to be uplifting and hopeful and not all about the doom and gloom. We're not going to spend ages saying why there's a climate emergency. We're taking that as red. Um, more conversations going on today in preparation for COP27. We know we're still far away from a lot of the commitments that were made in COP26. So, you know, it's not a rosy picture out there, but I think at the same time, there's lots to think about in terms of how creativity can move us forward, how design can move us forward, and some of the interesting conversations that are happening in the discipline today. So I'm going to try and stop sharing for a minute, or should I? Yeah, let's just stop sharing. It gets a bit. I thought it would be useful just to introduce um, the people we're talking to today. Um, so I'm going to pass over to colleagues to say something about themselves and what they're doing at the OU, and, um, and then we'll, we can move on to um, thinking about the first clip. So Derek, do you want to say something? Yeah, it always, always <laughs> want to say something, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Yep, so hi everybody, my name is uh, Derek Jones. I'm a lecturer, senior lecturer in uh, sustainable design at the Open University. I come from a practice background, a background in architecture. Um, and I guess my primary interest in terms of sustainability is how humans are or are not sustainable. Um, it's not necessarily the material aspects or the consequences, if you like, of sustainability or material use or design use. It's actually up here and why it is that we maintain unsustainable either lifestyles or positions. Um, and I'm very interested in that because I'm very interested in the stories that we tell ourselves, how we construct realities in our heads, both as designers and creatives as individuals that go about our business in the world. Um, so I guess I come at it from a slightly different angle and a slightly different perspective. Um, but yeah, it's still quite interesting. I think I would just touch on or re-amplify what Emma said. Um, that's not necessarily a negative thing at the Open University. We tend to welcome quite diverse, um, what shall we say, 
thinking or attitudes. Um, so it's quite nice to be in a place where you can actually think across certain boundaries. And certainly with the colleagues that are here tonight, that's definitely something that we do on an all too regular basis. So I'll maybe hand over to Stephen. Thank you very much and good evening, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be working with you all tonight and with my uh, brilliant design colleagues. Um, I joined the Open University about 22 years ago um, as part of the Energy and Environment Research Unit, and that has had a relationship with the design group um, going back much further than that, actually 40, 50 years. Um, so that kind of sitting in, in sort of energy and environment space has naturally been part of the design group. I'm, I'm not a designer i think like 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 the students and participants we have tonight who are studying design and probably understand design theory like some of my colleagues here tonight so i feel uh, you know i don't don't want to pretend that i understand design theory in the way in the way my curtain is bellowing um um so um but what, what i have i'm a physicist originally um and i'm interested in energy and sustainability i've done it all my life i've sort of probably one of the first PhDs um, at my University of Cambridge, where I did it in, in climate change, uh, certainly climate policy and systems analysis in the engineering department. Um, so I've been thinking about the problem for a very long time. And, and um, as Derek's just said, actually, I think one of the things that I've, that's, that's characterized my interest in this area is this sort of Venn diagram sort of between so sort of systems thinking, business thinking, design thinking, some aspects of leadership and organizational change. And, and it's all kind of, I, I, I've nibbled away at this over a period of years, <laughs> different perspectives um, to try to um, bring some sort of insight through, through my teaching, my public engagement. Um, so, and there is, there is, you know, I, I don't know why it's just come into my head, but this is supposed to be quite organic and informal. But I think we have two main problems, which I think demonstrate why we haven't kind of worked out how those disciplines actually all can, can come together to train people to, to in practice to do things. I, I think for a transition to a sustainable world, and if we're to avoid the very worst consequences of two degrees, two and a half degrees, that kind of thing. We need to be able to do, as a, as, as a society, we need to be able to do two things better than we currently can. They're very humble things, actually, which I think speaks a lot. The first one is we've got to be able to learn how to dig holes in the streets uh, in a more coordinated fashion and make sure that we can put services, you know, for, for a longer period in those holes and trenches. We, that, that absolutely dumbfounds us every time we're incapable. The second is we've got to understand what a wall is and its physical and social functions. And we've got to understand how to manage both the airflow and the moisture flow both ways through a wall. And both of those things are like a set of stairs to a Dalek. I mean, we just can't do either of them. Um, <laughs> So that's why I think thinking about these problems is really good because I think there's a lot that we need, we can do and need to do for that transition. Thank you. I will hand over to Alessandra. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, hello, welcome everyone. Um, well, thank you for um, inviting me to join this conversation tonight because I'm, I'm quite new at the Open University. I, I joined about eight months ago. Um, and about diversity of perspectives, well, my background is uh, in um, visual cultures and uh, creative arts. Um, so I, I'm interested in, uh, in art-based methodologies and uh, the power of the arts of uh, engaging people at an emotional level with global challenges, with uh, uh, social justice, climate change. Um, I have a practice-based based background, so I use art to work with communities and uh, I use art-based methods to work with communities. I'm also interested in what's happening in the global south right now. Um, 
I, I, in the past, I lived in Nepal and Thailand, and recently I started collaborating again with some organization in Nepal. And I'm just back, uh, I came back yesterday from Kathmandu, where uh, I spent a um, few days working with a fab lab in Kathmandu and with um, um, the Kathmandu University, the Art and Design Faculty. Um, so yes, my interest in is in action, is in activism and in activism and creative, uh, and creative activism. So how can we use creativity for a social action, for environmental action, for um, to help people understand ecological issues? Because I think, yes, art has this amazing power any kind of art and um, so yeah that 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 that's why that's what i'm interested in exploring and i hope to share tonight some of my experience in this sense and uh, also some stories from uh, from nepal recent stories from nepal uh, yes that's me thanks alexandra that's brilliant <clears throat> i think it's really important isn't it i don't think we spend enough time thinking about how we feel about climate change and or how it makes us feel and being or, or putting that into the design space as well as all the other things we've we've tended to link to design around climate change and more the technical side of things so i think um that aspect of the debate is definitely um one with many legs that we have to really expand on and think about as a community um I'll introduce myself very quickly as well. I'm Emma G. Berry. I've um, spent pretty much all of my professional career in, um, in higher education. I had a brief period after training as an industrial designer, as a furniture designer working in Malaysia. Um, and I came back to the UK and started my PhD um, with Robin Roy and Steve Potter. Robin Roy, I think, will be in one of the clips we see tonight. Um, and I think I was the first um, PhD in the UK in eco design, and I led um, uh, the first BA eco design at Goldsmiths and uh, first MSc in sustainable innovation at Cranfield, and have worked at Loughborough as well. And I've been at the Open University now um, since 2008. So um, I've, I've had sort of, I've been a student here as a PhD student. My first um, experience of the OU was actually probably 1973 um, uh, as a very young person whose mother had just decided to do this course, I think, or one of them in this series. And I remember a big box of tricks arriving through the post full of ping pong balls and balsa wood and various things that you had to create stuff out of, which was brilliant as a play toy um, as a young person. So I've, I've had quite a long relationship with the OU on and off. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here now as a senior lecturer um, and developing new design materials, particularly around design for sustainability, but a whole host of other issues, which I think are really important in expanding what, what the role of design is in society and how we can both move forward sort of social futures and ecological futures through design thinking. So um, before we go and talk um, or listen to the first clip, but we're not gonna um, bombard you with long clips tonight, just sort of a few minutes um, each really, but uh, I just wanted to set them up. So I'm gonna try and do the possible and try and share my screen again, which is always, uh, here we go. Does that share, let's have a look. Can you see that? <clears throat> yep. Good. Right. Okay, so <clears throat> before we, we see the first clip from Man May Futures, I just wanted to sort of reflect on um, this paper, which I first read many, many years ago, and it had a big impact on me. And I think it's, um, this is a, an image that someone else has created, um, Carlotta Cataldi, I think, but it's, it's based on a paper by Dana Meadows, um, who was part of the authors of The Limits to Growth um, that was on the original advert for this event tonight. And she talked about these 12 leverage points um, of how to intervene in a system. And, and what I like about this diagram is that in some sense, the system's at one side of the, of the fulcrum and, and there are these different points. And what we've tended to do a lot, I think particularly within our conversations around um, climate change and our our ways of dealing with climate change is focused very much 
on the things that are near the fulcrum on the right hand side which obviously if you press down it doesn't make much of a, an impression because you're very near that center of gravity point of view and it's only when you get to the very far end of the ones twos threes fours thinking about social system structures of change and mental models and consciousness of change that you can actually lever the system and start to make some inroads into changing that system so when we're talking about things like um you know, carbon trading and tariffs and tree planting and stuff that's about, you know, um, flows and taxes on materials or um, thinking about our resource limits or circular resources. Whilst all good to some degree, they are limited because they, they situate themselves in the current ways of thinking, the current system, and they don't really help us really move the debate forward into a different place, which is what we need to be doing. And that requires a slightly more emotional, I think, engagement with, you know, asking deeper questions about you know, what we consume, why we consume, um, how we live, what we use to live, what are our structures and systems that inform the ways in which we live? What rules do we decide to live by? How do we view community? How do we view family? How do we view individuals? How do we make these goals more evident to each other and have more conversations about them in more creative ways? How does that lead us to think about things in different ways? And how does that lead us to perhaps imagine other ways in which we could live and learn? And I think for me, one of the things about the Open University is that it's already situating itself as a very different place to learn because, you know, it's, it started itself as a very, you know, a social innovation to try and reach a place where education hadn't gone, it was really trying to move beyond that, you know, the traditional, a very preferential view of education for those that had the opportunity to, to access that. And particularly um, for women who had perhaps got married as they did in the 60s quite early and then had kids, you know, there was lots of people, including my mother, who, who did her degree through the Open University because it allowed them that opportunity to have a family and also learn and you know, continue to evolve themselves. And I think that's really important that we are perhaps thinking not only what role um, the OU has in this place going forward, but I would think more importantly, what role education has in um, the relationship between our material world, our ecological world, our social world, our world of learning and how design plays out in all of those spaces. So I wanted to sort of highlight Donella Meadows paper because I feel that's a really important paper. If you're going to read anything, go and read Donella Meadows paper on places to intervene in the system because it's a really um, interesting way of beginning to frame where change might need to happen and change, change that's purposeful and useful. And the other thing I wanted to say because we're not allowed to use the Horizon programme that's in 262 as a clip because it was a BBC OU production and the Horizon bit wasn't part of our rights to use in the archive. But one of the things this programme linked to um, was the new alchemists that were setting up in the States, John and Nancy Todd particularly, and their experimentation about communities of living and the technologies to support those communities around um, living machines essentially so how we can purify water and use it as agriculture agriculture looking at um, communities and self-sufficient ways of living where energy comes from relying on solar looking at waste flows in a different way so it's a very closed system approach to thinking about what communities um, or small communities self-sufficient local context communities could be, and there's a lot of design and technology and challenges to what was seen as the norms in those processes. And, and I think the point the programme makes, um, which we might, might reflect on, is, you know, in doing this, in making it radical and really challenging the way in which we might live, they were really making those values and those radical values at the time very clear because it was so different to what was done normally. And what is interesting in terms of design is obviously those values and assumptions that we see around us all the time are not made clear because they're seen as normal. And we don't question the values and assumptions that are driving a lot of the stuff we do as normal normative practices today because they are our norm. And so how do you begin to move to a more radical position without you know, um, scaring or making people fearful or for them to be accepting of those cultural changes 
um, without presenting things in, in, in very different ways. And I think this was a really interesting time in the early 70s where they were really engaging those sorts of debates. So um, from this sort of radical picture, which I think um, we might come back to later on, do we want to look at the first clip? Um, Derek, are you able to share that if I stop sharing? I think the whole, the whole society is terrified of change, yes. I mean, um, because those who are in control are, to a large extent, happy with the status quo. And therefore, the whole um, process of change is very largely dominated by an attempt to, to preserve the status quo. I think the designer has to see himself as a social being, not as an individual. I, I think the, the designer has to get away from the idea that he himself is going to change the world and has to realize that it's not the future that he's got to be concerned with, it's the present. What connections would you say there are between design, technology, and the future? Well, design and technology are closely connected. Most designing is some kind of socially relevant technological activity. Designing can also mean more subjective and personal kinds of activity. But as I shall use the word, to design means to create and to choose the technology which under underpins the structure of our society and which we come to rely upon for maintaining and promoting our way of life. The futures connection derives from the fact that this kind of design activity is inherently orientated towards the future. The designer makes a proposal, a design, for something which is to be produced, distributed, and used at some time in the future. The buildings, the machines, the systems that we use now were all designed at some time in the past. Their designers had to imagine and to propose how we could use these things. And because the things we use often play an important part in our lives, this imagining and proposing of the future in design must be done with care. To some extent, the way we live now, insofar as it is affected by the technology we use, is conditioned by what designers in the past have imagined and proposed for us. In this sense, design is future creating. And sometimes this future creating ability becomes very powerful. For example, influential visionary architects of the early 1900s, who in drawings like these proposed radically new forms of housing design, helped to create a future, which is our present, of high-rise tower block flats. But as well as being future creating, design is also future dependent. The designer's proposals only become reality at some future time. So if they are to be successful, then their proposals will have to match the environment of social, economic, technical constraints, which will also exist at that future time. This environment is constantly evolving, independently of any particular isolated design act, and the designer therefore has to anticipate the future environment. And this anticipation of the future is becoming more important, as designers have to look further ahead into a more uncertain future. Yeah, so I think it's kind of painfully obvious, um, probably immediately, that um, although that was maybe 50 years ago, there's some things that maybe haven't changed all that much over that period of time. And I guess that might be the first thing that I would maybe draw from um, some of this, this first clip would be around about the idea of time itself. Um, and I'd maybe like pose a few observations about the clip and some of the things that some of the interlocutors um, like mentioned, and then maybe just ask some of my colleagues just what their thoughts on it might be as well. Um, and even just starting with that last phrase, uncertain future, I mean, that was as, as true 50 years ago as it is today, if not more so today in some ways. I think we've actually felt uncertainty a little bit more closely, uh, even over the last few weeks and months, um, compared to where we might have been, say, a decade ago, 20 years, maybe 30 or 50 years ago. But uncertainty is actually also an inherently human thing. Um, because it's, well, it's, as Bob once said to you, Stephen, I think it's, it's all very well talking about sustainability, but what are you trying to be sustainable for? And if it's being sustainable for humanity, for people, then you've got to then address this question of uncertainty um, or of how people are positioned, if you like, in time and space. I'm not going to overly intellectualise this. Don't worry. Don't panic too much. I, maybe just the first simple one, this idea of time. 
and why we are so fantastically bad at looking into the future, at actually imagining what the future might be, and then going about making that happen. The imagining bit is no problem. You saw there are some examples, I think that was from Corbusier, some of his Unité de Um Again, there's no problem coming up with these ideas. It's how you actually realize them or how you transform things to actually create that. Um, and that's before you ask the critical questions of why are you actually doing that in the first place? I think there was another point that Gerald made, I think in that clip as well, that's really, really quite important. And that it's the fact that design isn't about the future to be quite honest and blunt with you. I mean, in my design career, there's been a couple of times where I've actually got to you know, get the blank piece of paper and actually have a go at creating something that hasn't genuinely been created before. Because 90% of the time you are recreating what's already there. You're already working, if not in the present, then at the very least in the past. A lot of the time you're actually recreating the past, to be quite honest with you. And we tend to get really stuck in these kind of like positions of the present. And that's where the real problem is, because we're not able to, if you like, project forward beyond that. Um, and I think this is still largely true. I still think I don't think that has changed all that much, I think, in the last 50 years. There's a few things that have. I think maybe Stephen, my colleague, he will actually talk about some of the places where we actually have had the chance to know a bit more about it. But for me, the alarming fact is a human lesson, is the fact that we still haven't done anything about getting better at it. We've got better tools to be able to look at the future. Our ability to simulate, to compute, to augment our cognition, to augment our intelligence has never been better. And yet, what do we do? We use it to create strange images of cats mixed with poets and hope that we'll get a new birthday card out of it. It's all a bit strange and a bit weird. It's the purpose to which we're actually applying human value that's a bit of a problem, I think, for uh, me just now. But anyway, there's another thing that happens. There's a, a kind of weird pre-bound effect that happens if you're not able to look into the future. And it happens back in education. It makes it really hard for us as educators. If people are constantly focusing on thinking that the future is just an extension of the present, then that gives us a double bind problem. It's another Bateson thing. Um, it means that it's hard for us to break apart, if you like, the traditions of how people come to us thinking in a certain structured way and how we then get people to not just see what the future is, but see how to get to the future. That's the, the more port important part. That's the bit that's kind of missing. And it's the bit that we have to, I think, focus on in education. So basically, we are really, really poor at seeing beyond certain horizons as human beings. We are really, really bad at seeing anything beyond our own little doorstep or our own little horizon. Um, and we're terrible at working with the future. Just generally, it means that we're not very good at this. And we have to ask kind of why that is. I think there was another clue in there about power and control. And we might come onto that a little bit later on, but I do think that these two things are actually quite importantly linked. I think Gerald suggested that it was actually those in control who are also quite happy with the status quo. And this for me is one of the big things that has changed in the last 50 years our understanding, not just of social psychology, but of social systems and of complex systems and of the tools of not manipulating them, but working with them, they definitely have gotten better. But our ability to actually change ourselves as an organizing thing, society, has actually got slightly worse, to be quite honest with you. And I wonder whether or not the issue is less to do with those in control and actually more to do with everybody else who accepts control. And this is part of a deeper pedagogical theory um, by a Brazilian academic and theorist called Paulo Freire. And I was reminded by this by well, Stephen, actually, during the week when we were doing a bit of a rehearsal for this, because I still do firmly believe that education is one of those things that can actually make a significant difference to sustainable futures. But as Stephen quite correctly challenged me on this, it's not the way that we currently do education that is going to do that. It's actually developing learning as opposed to continuing to teach. Um, and I think we need to shift to a much more, um, what shall we say, critical pedagogy if we're going to do those kind of different things. Um, so that's something for me that really, really has changed in the last 50 years, but that we haven't actually gotten on top of. Because if we accept that it is leaders who are to blame, and don't get me wrong, they are very much to blame, but that doesn't mean that there isn't other bits of blame to go around then it means that we actually lose that last pivot point and that lovely piece of graphic that Emma pointed out. We completely and utterly abrogate our power to make any kind of change in a system. It means that if we say it's the responsibility or the fault of leaders, 
we are actually adopting then the behaviours that are expected of us, to use Paulo Freire's language, we are actually acting as if we are being oppressed by the oppressors. We're engaging in the behaviours that maintain the existing systems. And it means that we don't actually have power to do anything with it. Another thing that happens is we forget to how to actually exercise power, or let me use a different phrase here, how to actually exercise empowerment. So a lot of my frustration as a professional and practicing designer came from not being able to express my empowerment as a designer, not being able to think that I could make a particular type of difference. And that's because I was trying to make a difference by designing stuff. I wasn't trying to make a difference by changing the minds of the people for whom I was designing or designing with the people for whom I was designing. None of that happened. So you're almost in the wrong place to be asking those sorts of questions. Um, and again, if we don't remind ourselves that we need to actually actively work at this, then some really bad stuff can actually happen. And it came very close to it in the United States. And even in the UK, if we don't take care of our democracy, of the way that we look after ourselves, of the way that we sustain our society, then the rest of it is going to very, very, very quickly collapse. Um, I suppose the final one I would add to that is if we abrogate that power, if we just give it away, if we just constantly say that this is part of a system or it's something that's not to do with us, then we actually then start to almost like control ourselves. It's almost like what we call in them creative design circles. It's like self-censorship. It's the stuff that you don't even think you can think. Uh, and if you're already bringing that sort of mindset to design, then you've already started from the wrong position, as Emma talked about earlier. So for me, there's those two things. One, how bad we are at dealing with time. And I think that that is strongly linked to how we see ourselves in relation to the rest of society as a kind of function of power. And I think those are the two big things that we really need to tackle in design education in order to let people sort of think differently as designers. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I can see by my colleagues' slightly stunned faces that, yeah, I've maybe talked too much there. Um, yeah, a bit of a rant. I won't do it again, sorry. Not at all, Derek. Um, I think there's so many points that you've raised that are so important. And I think the notion of particularly power, empowerment, the horizons of our ability to see and the boundaries by which we work, <laughs> particularly in the context of design in, you know, des design is still in a sense um, in the throes of being a, a service to industry. You know, it's not, we're not, we've not moved beyond that particularly well to, to, to forge that discipline of concern, of purpose, of care um, to these other issues, to, to the ways in which people can use this type of thinking for other types of purpose. And I think, you know, those, those ideas of what values, what resources, what, what concerns of the future you align with in order to get to that point, um, particularly to tip, to begin to tip that, pre that, that system on that fulcrum, you know, how can design play out at those other levels? I think it's really important. And something which I hope we can continue to evolve at the OU um, in, in the new qualifications that we're, we're developing. Because, you know, until we have that, you know, you think about when the 1975 course was, was launched, I mean, we'd had the, the riots and the activism that was very rife in the 60s. We'd had, we had were in, the, you know, just at the end of that energy crisis. You know, there's not, it's not so dissimilar in terms of dis um, dissent or concerns about power and leadership as were then and have been ever since so why has the normative way of viewing design continued despite all these other things going on around it and why has education not managed to um, I guess form other types of, of reality for, for students to engage with I mean it's really clear isn't it even if you look at school education, d and has become increasingly less prevalent. Um, ideas of creative literacy, and particularly anything to do with eco-literacy, is completely not really part of the ways in which we are teaching or furthering our, our students, our young generation, to see that as being an important aspect of, of engaging with um, climate debates or other social debates. And therefore, we are we are in a, a sort of very peculiar situation. And I think 
you know, if I was to take things from that particular clip, it's how, how, how do we move on? What, what, what process within the discipline moves us on? And what, how do we develop communities of practice, which I think we have shown through the pandemic has been evolving. How do we develop those carefully, considerately, inclusively to um, have many more examples of, of good practice coming, coming about? And one of the things we did, um, I'm just going to share one slide before I let, before I let anybody else do, I'm just going to only share one. She said, oh, it's just not very fluid, this whole malarkey. There we go. Does that, does that share? So this is a slide that um, we were evolving, I guess, 20 years ago now. I worked on a project um, uh, based on the Agenda 21 um, to report that went to the government. And it was looking at the future of um, sustainable design education in the UK. It was it's future sustainable education, full stop. Design was one of the disciplines chosen to be explored. Um, and the, the project was working with um, partners, including the Royal Society of Arts and Manufacturing and the Design Council, and a number of HEIs across the UK who were focusing on design. Um, and we were looking at, is there a way of beginning to position um, design in relation to sustainability that would help us try and navigate some of these interdisciplinary spaces, if you like, where there's a scientific language around sustainability and there was a, a more creative and I guess still service oriented, as in service to industry oriented language around design. And what we'd had today was very much, you know, from the clean production side of things from the 70s onwards, sustainability as an add-on to design technology um, change. And what we needed was to recognize that sustainability was a much bigger thing than design and, and design or any other discipline needs to sit itself within sustainability and its broader parameters in order to begin to open itself up for those boundaries, those discipline boundaries to become more permeable and for new knowledge to be able to see both ways in and out. So um, sustainability is informed through some of the design activities that's going on and equally design is informed by um, the debates and sustainability. Um, for design particularly, it was around debates of equity, sufficiency, um, looking at um, resource flow, sorry, the dog's trying to knock the door down, uh, <laughs> and, and really trying to move that agenda of what design is in the context of um, a higher education institution. And that, that at the time was very challenging and, it, and it, didn't, it didn't evolve into a mass uptake as to what design for sustainability was. But for a few people and an ongoing group of people, who were looking at this in research terms, it was very much trying to um, ad address, a, along with others in Northern Europe, particularly, and I have to say not particularly the Global South at the time, this sense of, um, you know, how we, how we challenge the design space and where design sits in the context of higher ed and how it also sits in practice. And I think that's where perhaps some of those origins around um, care and purposefulness and challenging the relationship between teaching and activism sit too. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Stephen, did you want to come in? Um, well, very briefly, and then uh, Alessandra may wish to just comment something. Um, well, I've learned something from both of you there and really enjoyed your reflections on that on that video. And what, what popped up for me was um, one of the uh, people being interviewed there, the, the um, chap in the light jumper was Gerald Leach, and he wrote a um, famous report in the time, the 1974, I think it was, a low energy strategy for the UK. And he was quite unpopular because basically he was saying, well, if we, if, why do we assume we need all this coal? And why do we assume we need all this oil? What, what if we didn't need it all? And what if we what if we planned differently for a low energy? Now, and it's quite controversial. Um, and, you know, we didn't have Twitter trolls then. But if we had have had Twitter trolls, he would have been trolled. You know, he was getting, there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of criticism. And, um, but he wasn't professional. And he came from a certain intellectual point of view. And he's, you know, maybe people were, you know, 
where he was, you know, was he, was he really, was he Marxist, what, you know, whatever the agen agendas were at the time. Um, but um, some of the things that I may say when, a little bit further on um, when we talk about the future is I'm going to sound like Gerald Leach, I'm afraid. Um, there's nothing I can say today which, which, which he didn't say in, back in the mid 70s. <laughs> Um, and I don't, you know, I'm a bit depressed about that, really, I suppose, because it's a shame that, and, and when I, you know, when I explain to people that are low energy, you know, we're not just talking about low carbon strategies, but, but you have to have a low energy strategy, you know, a low consumption strategy, because that's the only way we're going to make this uh, sort of transition sort of stack up. So that just feels like a broken record, but um, it's, it's still a very important message. So I'll make that message again. This business about future creating and future dependent, and that's really interesting to hear that, and that we build the, the, the machines and buildings that we use today are built in the past. But actually, the climate problem, the sustainability crisis, whether you call it sustainability crisis and you think of the, you know, the Rockstrom radar, whether you think of it singularly as, as one aspect of it, the climate, it's, it's the same issue that we are living as if we have several planets and we only and we only have one. Um, but that, 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 that sort of, we're the first generation which has really consciously been asked to kind of um, think about the idea that we are creating the future, but that future, the Industrial Revolution was the past and that created the issue that we've got now. Um, so it's both future creating and future dependent. We're like on a bike and we're riding the bike and we're starting to wobble because we've gone into some sort of kind of wobble because we're saying, actually, no, the future we are creating is also very path dependent and it's accelerating and it's not the right way. And, oh, gosh, and I feel that's where we are. There's lots of the markets are doing that. The, the investors are doing that. The venture capitalists are doing that. They're not sure which or is it hydrogen? Is it green? Is it blue? Is it pink? What, 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 are, we doing? what are we doing? We've got to do something. Um, so we kind of got a really unique moment that I don't think it's it, it's not like the moment that we faced with you know the Cuban missile crisis or the general anxiety in the post-war period about nuclear um you know nuclear annihilation it, it's different it's another kind of existential threat and and um yeah that that clip just brought all that to the fore for me and over to Alessandra thank you Stephen um Yes, there, there are there are a lot of interesting points in that clip, but I think what was uh, particularly strong for me is the definition of designer as social as a social being. What does it mean, designer as a social being? Um, it, it mean, I mean, in, in 1975, it meant something very different from what it means today. Because society is different, and um, and how can we designers be social being in, in a way that for sure doesn't save the world, but maybe help saving the world with other people, with society, with communities. Um, yeah, I, I, I really think that interaction with communities, with interaction with society and probably the, the society that the designer used to interact with is different from, uh, in the past is different from today because um, today designers need to be activists. That, that's that's my, my main point. While in the past, maybe they were um, working for corporations or being more integrated into a status quo. I think for being, um, for helping to save the world, we need to be, we need to act, we need to, um, we need to be activists to engage in um, in meaningful action, whatever it, it, it may mean. And, um, and, and, and designers are creative and that's a big, big, big power. Um, it's, it, it's a massive uh, strength, especially when engaging with society, when engaging with communities, uh, we can help society. So yes, it's true as in the video that designers shouldn't think that they can save the world, but if they act, if they use their creativity to engage with communities, with society in an active way, I think they can do a lot. So 
That's a brilliant point. Use use creativity for good. <laughs> um, Derek, do you do want to show the next two short clips together, and then sure. maybe yep. Stephen could yeah comment on that. Surely. Suppose that a forecast of the likely demand for energy over the next 20 years looked like this. Since the major goal of the industrial system is to maintain growth, the usual response would be to attempt to supply the projected demand, say by designing nuclear power plant or exploring for new oil reserves. An alternative response would be to question the desirability of such a growth in demand and to take steps to stabilize it by, for instance, redesigning buildings to conserve energy and promoting public transport. In the present, these social values implicit in design are so often taken for granted that it becomes easy to forget that they're there. It's only when radical alternatives are proposed that we're forced to become conscious of our own particular values and assumptions. It's fairly easy to see the values and assumptions of the new alchemists because they deliberately try to make these values and assumptions explicit and because their proposals are outside of the mainstream of technological development. But it's not so easy to see the values and assumptions that are continually being built into design proposals that are within the mainstream. We tend to take it for granted that the future will unfold as a shinier version of the present with ever more advanced technology. I'd like now to introduce two authors who have been concerned with aspects of technological change. Uh, David Dixon is the author of the book Alternative Technologies and Gerald Leach is a writer and broadcaster on aspects of science and technology. David, uh, I'd like to start with you. I was wondering whether you would agree with me that um, designers do have the kind of future creating power that I suggested earlier. Yes, I, I think I'd take issue over your use of the word creating. Um, I would agree that designers have a, a great deal to do with presenting possibilities for the future, showing the type of form that the future might take. But what I would disagree with was this form of individualistic power which you seem to place in the hands of the designer to say that designer himself is a highly powerful character. I would like to say that one, the type of model one should take is of a range of possibilities being presented at, at any one time by a number of designers. And the important process one should look at is that which selects from one of this range of possibilities the particular one which is going to be introduced into society at any one time. One has two processes which are often confused. The one is the process of technological invention, which is something which can be done by an individual. I mean, we all have our image of the inventor working in a little back, um, a small shed at the back of his house, dreaming up some type of fantastic technological machine, which, in his opinion, is going to change the shape of the world. But if we really want to understand our technological environment, I think we should be looking at the process of technological innovation. And technological innovation is a social process. It's determined by external, social, economic, and very often political norms. And it is this that we've got to look at if we're going to try to understand why particular technological inventions have been introduced into society, in other words, have been innovated at any particular time in history. Gerald Leach, I would wonder if you would like to refer to the other side of the coin, to the future-dependent aspect that I referred to. Uh, do you think designers really do adopt a, a stance towards the future? Well, I think it's part of the same, same coin that um, Dave is talking about. You know, it's, it's not the invention that's important, but what is innovated, what is selected by the the group that's employing and controlling the inventor. And this also applies to, to the future dependency. See, I don't think that um, firms, industry, multinational corporations can look, do look very far into the future. What they base themselves on, what they base their actions on, are, is the present and a short-term extrapolation into the future, which is very much a, like a run-on of the present because society has such a huge inertia that it's not going to change in five years. Now, if someone comes up and says, look, the future is going to be very different, for example, the cost of energy is going to double, therefore you should make small cars, just, just to select one example, um, the inventor isn't going to react to that unless the, the forecaster can be 99% positive that this major change is going to come about. Now, you can very rarely do that, and therefore you go on um, basing your, your short-term future, your, your, uh, therefore your current designs, um, on the present situation. And I think the future has very little impact on, on, on what large industries actually do. 
Okay, there we go. So once again, it's that idea of designers working in the present. Um, I was quite struck there, actually, just, just listening to that again, that difference between prediction versus determining. So I mean, going back to that Corbusier sketch, you know, that, that's classical architectural determinism, the determinism at its best. It's the period where a lot of architects generally did think that they could change society for the better by making big buildings, and that's all you needed to do. Um, look how that turned out, by the way. Let's not go there. We can make that a subject of a, another conversation. But it, it, was, it was interesting just um, how Gerald there was he, was, he was talking very much about it being a predictive model rather than a deterministic model, uh, i.e., what is it that we want to achieve as a society, as humanity, as any one of these identities? And again, I think it goes back to that other clue that we don't make visible, we don't make explicit, or a lot of the bits of our system doesn't make explicit exactly what their motives are, what it is that they're wanting to actually achieve. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, Stephen, I didn't mean to jump yeah, sorry, in. There. No, no, <laughs> I'm always fascinated to listen to you, Derek, and it's it's um, it's always a privilege to hear the cogs of your brain thinking. Um, Yes, yeah, so we had Robin. We had Robin Roy, our own emeritus professor of design, saying essentially this supply side mentality versus the kind of what what shape of the curve. Do we want the curve to flatten off, or are we just going to build it and they will come? You know, the classic example is is, the, is, the, is traffic and roads. You know, you build more roads, you get more traffic. It's it's, it's self determining. It's a bit like that with energy consumption. But we we have decoupled quite a number of aspects of. Of, of energy consumption from economic growth. Now, the, the best example we can give is light. LEDs have completely transformed the amount of electricity that we need for the amount of lumens, even, even when we waste them, even when we light our homes like Blackpool illuminations when we don't need to, the LEDs are so efficient that the impact of that on the power system is, isn't as great as it was. So that's a, that's a lovely example. Um, unfortunately, the internal combustion engine vehicles aren't that that didn't quite happen like that and and the energy use for space heating in homes didn't quite happen like that so, so we haven't got it all right but we but we have we have done some things where where we are now what, what these clips make me think about is that where we are now is that um if you look at the latest ipcc report and i'm going to show the front cover of that in a minute for a different reason um it's it, it is now it, it was quite radical at the time for robin to say but what if we don't have a growth strategy? What if we question it? That was, it was quite, now that isn't radical anymore. Everybody's doing that. Everybody's saying, how can we bend the curve? And they've all got their little models. Oh, that's so patronizing. They've all got their models and they um, are busy working these kind of socio-technical models to sort of say, how, how can I sort of play a game where I want to get the carbon down or the energy down and and I'll choose this. Uh, we'll do it. We'll, here's the curve, and and we'll make we'll sort of say something about the society that lies behind the curve. But but where we're failing, and where I think these two this discussion was was heading, if we could listen to more of the context with it, is what what tell me more about the flat version of society. Tell me something that wants that makes it attractive that makes me want to work towards it to be creative towards it to invest in it as a future whereas i think right now as we panic and we are in a very mass state of socio-technical panic we are looking at modelers and we're asking them to give us you know sets of lines which do stack up to net i don't like the word net by the way net usually means not not zero it's not net it's not it's an it, yeah it, so it's pushing the can down the road. So we, call, we, we might say near zero or, or lower carbon futures. Um, so that there's, there's something there about the task that lies ahead. So what's radical today for us, for design, for design thinking, is to be bolder and more imaginative about how we draw people towards these you know, these curves, you know, we've got to make it tangible. Is, is it a composite? Is it, is it an image of a build? What is it? You know, what is it? I don't know the answer. Um, but that's, that's, that's the beautiful task for us to, for, for us to dwell upon. And um, 
this discussion at the end um, between um, a Leach and um, what was the other chap's name? Um, Wilkins was it? Is is it the inventor, or is it how how are winning technologies? How do they emerge? I think we've got better, certainly in academia, of trying to express that. We we've, we've got we've got sort of some quite you know word cherished um, theories of of tra transition theory and socio technical theory and change, and 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 some academics are really quite attached to all of that. Um, in practice, are we getting good at, tra at, at emergency transitions? I would say not generally. I'm not sure that we've got enough example. I can give you two examples in, in short while where I think we are, things are going quite well, but we do seem to, we are betting our future on this idea that, oh yeah, right. We, we, we've got this real problem with um, the Earth, and it's you know we're, we're living as if we had three Earths and we've only got one. So we've got to radically change. So the answer is net zero and this thing called transition. So we'll all just buy a transition. I'll go out and buy one. You buy one. Well, I've got one. It's called an e-bike. That's my transition. And an electric car. That's my transition. It's bling. Let's buy our. Let, let's manufacture and buy our way. It, that's where we are. And and I think those that that debate that. In that clip there that was going underneath about really questioning growth and and need and consumption and and the structure of society and power and governance i don't think we've we again we've, we've moved much further on i'll try and uh, hand over to my colleagues but i just wanted at this point to share um a couple of slides um um which i was going to is that sharing now share yeah so i mean energy has been my thing for some years so i published this my first popular science book my wife is a bit naughty she says to me how do you know it's going to be popular and i say no that's 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 the genre darling it's, it's the genre but um anyway it's um i try to explain something that was being said in my group here at the in, in the design group at the energy environment research unit and it used to be called the alternative technology group it's had many guises but I'm, I'm proud to be part of that history and this is me re-articulating it's the same story and the story basically is that we are awash with renewable energy and we could power the earth on just a few minutes of sunshine quite quite easily so why don't we do it well yeah well it's this thing to do with power and inertia and technical systems and so on but however we've really got to try and think now, as the first generation in, in, in Godfrey Boyle's time, when he was writing about the mid 70s, our, our professor, renewable energy then, it was about oil dependency, about war, about anti-nuclear sentiments. These were the reasons you might think of a solar future. Um, those reasons still exist today, but what really exists today on top of all of that is the ticking clock, right? We've got several ticking clocks. The alarms, in fact, are going off. You know, there's several alarms already going off. It's just alarms and ticking clocks. And we've, we've also got to really do something really quite quickly. And we know that's the, that's the emergency. So, um, look, this is sort of getting at this point about questioning the assumptions about our debate and whether we're actually being honest with ourselves about the task ahead. Um, we actually only need a very small fraction of the energy, for example, that we use. But the global energy consumption is absolutely vast, because partly because we still rely on thermal processes for electricity, which is hopefully going to change to wind and solar. So that, there's a third of it there, that second uh, row down, that, 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 that can change. And if we shift to solar and wind for the rest of it, then then that's that's going to be very helpful for that but basically even if we shift everything to solar and wind today we're still wasting tons and tons of energy <laughs> through very poor design of um of objects manufactured items buildings and cities we we, we waste an awful lot of energy and even if we uh, emma waved her magic eco design wand and said ta-ta right that's that's a more efficient society we still actually tend to put the wrong fuels through the wrong routes so that's a physics that's a subtle physics point but it's actually very important that we don't use the right fuels for the right uses now if you get all of that right the actual need is very small now 
that is quite a radical statement because what's actually happening at the moment is people are saying how can we supply this huge blue bar that you see on the screen with renewables and quite rightly some people say no renewables will never cope with this we're, we're doomed you know well that's again that's framing the, the challenge in a very in a very um catastrophic way to begin with so we're being invited this we're being invited to think about that what does society look like with those flattening or descent curves and to make that something that politically we want to buy into and um well, look here. Here is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change. This is their the third of three reports they've they've released for their sixth assessment, and it has on it this beautiful image. I don't know if it's in in Holland or Britain. I don't know where uh, Germany. You've got some houses sharing a garden. They've got renewables on the roof. The houses look warm. It looks like it's a low impact development. It's precisely what was in our open university materials for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, uh, it, it, that vision is, is, is something that the open university has, has taught, I mean, tens of thousands of students over 50 years, uh, whether it be a original image uh, from, from the Undercurrents magazine, um, or, or whether it be uh, more recent teaching that we've done with photographs of the Hockerton housing project in the UK. Um, so we need to we need to go further and deeper than, than, than that image. And we need to make understand why um, the designed world is is not just about the way things look, but what is happening, who lives there, what are the relationship, what are they doing with their time, what are their consumption patterns and so on. Now, can we can we create technical futures? Um, yes, we can. Um, is, it, is it one person? Is it, is it one you know, powerful person sitting in a room and he or she are just sort of saying, yeah, this is the future we decide? I'm, or or is, it, is, it, is it a social process? Yes, it is. It's a policy process. And the, the, the crashing costs of photovoltaics and onshore wind and for the... Um, uh, the cost of um, batteries, which are helping things like EVs become reasonably affordable. Um, these are the result. They're not, they're not the result of random inventions. There might be some of that in, 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 in the fog, but they're the result of a very complicated and very sustained uh, trillion dollars in each case of government funding with policy pulls and mark, market pulls and policy pushes to try to create um, these kinds of cost breakthroughs, which then, you know, kind of result in the absolute phenomenal growth we've seen recently in the uptake of photovoltaic panels in the a number of onshore wind installations and the amount of EVs, which are all going kind of in the right direction. Then to actually reach net zero for 1.52 degrees, the amount of funding, the, the transition rate has to be 10 times, 10 times what it is today. So there's a great success here, but... And, and the, the global wind industry just cannot keep it. Supply chains just cannot keep up at the moment. And they're not making any money, by the way, which is, which is really very weird. But we've, we've got to accelerate even further. It's, it's quite a challenge. But that, there is, you know, we have learned something about creating technical futures. And I think these are very compelling. These are very compelling um, um, ideas for me. And then I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to let my, some of my colleagues say something. Alessandra, do you want to um, do your slides and then we'll come back? Because I think the points yeah. about, um, you know, supply, demand and, and that the whole thing around energy need is so fascinating. But perhaps you, you go forward and then we can have a con con conversation at the end. Yes. Can, can you see my screen? Okay, so yes, I I just want to start sharing an image that is really inspirational for me because it shows the power of art, eh, of communicating and engaging at an emotional level. Uh, this is a site-specific installation uh, produced for the Venice Biennale in 2017 by Lorenzo Quinn, which is the, the, the artist. And it is obviously about the rising uh, water level in, in Venice due to, due to climate change. And to me, and probably 
to the thousands of people just passing by <laughs> on the ferries. Uh, this image screams that we are in an emergency and we need to act. Um, and the way that art has a screaming, I think is unique, is uh, radical, to go back at the concept of radical that has been mentioned quite a few times tonight. Um, and perhaps effective, very effective in a call to action, exactly for this uh, uh, capability of engaging people on an emotional level. Um, so radical and action are, are, are the two terms that really made me reflect a lot when I watched the, um, the video and tonight in this, uh, in this uh, conversation. Climate change is radical. Climate vulnerability is radical. So how can we be radical in response to these events? And how can we designers, creatives, educators use creativity in a radical way? And, being radical is not a choice anymore, it's a need, and it is a need for us, but it's a, a need, uh, probably it's, it's a more urgent need in, 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 sub, in some parts of the global south, um, where climate change, it's, it, you can feel it, you can feel it on your skin. Uh, people can feel it on, on their skin. It's, it's really tangible. Um, I, I'm just back from, from Nepal, as I mentioned earlier, where um, you can feel the monsoon, the unpredictability of the monsoon that has become random, extremely long and heavy with, uh, big repercussion for agriculture, of course, uh, on the hills, but also in the cities in, in, in Kathmandu, which becomes absolutely chaotic due to this uh, heavy and unpredictable rain. Um, climate change is tangible in, uh, in some very, very uh, sad social issues that uh, have been reported by several organizations I talked to. And one of these, uh, probably uh, one of the most dramatic is uh, the rise of child marriages in the remote villages, because uh, families that rely on farming are struggling to cope with uh, success succession of droughts and uh, floods uh, that destroy the harvest. So they, they, they have to... Uh, marry of their daughters. But in a positive way, I think that climate change and um, climate issues are tangible also in a more positive way. And in, in, in some positive stories that I, I heard and um, I could collect in, in, in my time in Kathmandu. And in the desire to act of young Nepalese designers, engineers, and creatives, their desire to research, to experiment, and look for practical solutions that may impact their country, their city, their village, um, but also maybe can impact us, the global north, because this is something that we don't consider quite often that maybe, uh, solutions can come from unexpected places, unexpected unexpected people. And um, so we should be radical in how we look for solutions probably and change a bit our perspective of where the solution or ideas can come from. Um, so these, these images are from the uh, lab, Fab Lab in Kathmandu, which is the first humanitarian Fab Lab in, uh, in the world. And it was created after the, uh, the idea was born after the earthquake in 2015, because Nepal realized that they didn't, uh, uh, they couldn't manufacture anything and they had to rely on India and China. So they, they wanted uh, a group of people started uh, with the idea of uh, uh, having manufacturing, prototyping uh, possible in, in, in Kathmandu. This means allow, allowing creativity. This means allowing people to look for solution. Um, and this other image uh, is one of the, of the solution that um, um, th this, these people in the, in, in the picture shared with me. They are a, gr a group of young engineers. Um, and they developed um, this, uh, um, this, this sort of machines uh, that uh, is an algae reactor. So 
basically, the, 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 the fun this machine functioned by uh, taking water from the Basmati River, which is a very polluted river in the center, center of Kathmandu, and using algae that are present in the river to um, purify the water, produce oxygen, and then oxygen is released. Um, they started from the idea that they needed more trees and that's not possible in Kathmandu because it's overpopulated, it's overbuilt, so there is no possibility of planting trees. So they, they looked at um, technology that could replace trees and they came up with this um, uh, this algal reactor, which is not a new idea, but I think the, the really important thing is that this has been designed, prototyped, um, manufactured in, in Nepal, so in a developing country, by Nepalese engineers, young engineers, looking for solution to climate issues in their local communities. Uh, they managed to have the government, um, the, the government approved this machine and they, they, they bought a few of them and they're going to be placed along the river. Uh, as you can see, they, you, they're bright. So you can see the lead inside that, that helps the, uh, the process of uh, purifying water and producing oxygen. Um, but when placed within the city, within the communities, they also become a sort of installation. And I hope that this will also improve the, the, um, the way that people have of, of engaging with the, the, the river, the area around the river, which is very, uh, very much let down at the moment. Um, so yes, it is. It, it produces oxygen. Uh, it wants to engage people and to make the city uh, more uh, accessible, more pleasant to, uh, for, for, for people engaging with the, the machine. Um, when I talk to uh, Gunjan, which is the, 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 the guy, the director of this, um, um, this company and the guy in the picture, uh, he said that they don't, necessarily need solution, they need trust. Uh, they need trust from us, from the, the, from the global north, because uh, they feel that, um, that we, we, we don't look at vulnerable developing countries for solutions. So we just look at them as places where the problem is, where the, where the problem, problem is particularly significant. But they, they might have the knowledge, the skills, and the desire of looking for solution and producing solution. Um, so we, we, they want to be heard. And, and, and I think what we can do here is just being radical in uh, uh, being open and more open and uh, listen and accept ideas and look for ideas outside of our um, of uh, our boundaries. Um, look for ideas that are developed in the local context by local people. Um, because yes, they, 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 they might have the, 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 an answer for a lot of questions, or at least they want to discuss their answers to a lot of questions. Um, so yes, I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks so much, Alessandra. That was so moving and inspirational, both Stephen and yourself. It's it's so it's really good to have different perspectives on on this very complex issue. And I and I love the point of ending in the sense of being more open. The you know, OU's already had a mandate to be open, and the radical position is to be more open, more transparent, more listening, more co-creation of solution, more co-creation of learning, I think is, um, is a great place to, to sort of end the conversation today. But I think we've all talked quite a lot and I just wonder, um, people that have stuck with us all evening, whether you've got particular points that you'd like to raise, questions you'd like to ask or thoughts that have come up during the conversation, um, it'd be really great to hear from you. Hannah, you've been brave and left your your video on, and uh, you must you, you must want to say something. Go on. 
Well, um, I've been doing lots of drawing actually for my T217 exam. But anyway, I found this really interesting because I'm also doing the, um, my next module is the DST206 environment, um, dynamic planet. So to do the two together, I'm just finding is really, really interesting. The design work with the environment, not that it's particularly each module, but to, to be able to put them together. And I think I might come back and look at this recording at a later date as well, once I get started on the next one. It's a good course, that, you know, the DST. Yeah, very good. Oh, well yeah. done. And are you going to show us one of your drawings then? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Excellent. <laughs> well done. Thank you. But no, it was just nice to listen and take that all in, you know, doing um, U101 and 116 last year. So, um, you know, it's, it's, putting it, it's putting it all together and just really interesting to listen to. So thank you. And I think Anne, uh, I see it raised hand. Anne, do you want to, to say something? Yes, hi. Um, I'm an assistant professor in economics at Coventry University and um, very long standing interest in environmental economics. And we're just reviewing our economics programs at the moment to understand where sustainability, climate change, and environment fits within a standard economics program. And it's been a very challenging task, I have to say, and I'm not sure that we're all comfortable with, with the final result. But what I wanted to say this evening is that so much of what you've been talking about is really resonating with me in, in a completely different discipline. You know, here I am with a long experience of economics and what I'm hearing from you, if I've understood you correctly, is what I'm feeling about my own discipline. And I suppose some of those things are to do with your comments around, um, you know, our consideration of time. And I feel that so much of my teaching time is spent looking at economic trends going, going into the past, rather than thinking about, okay, where do we envisage these trends going forward? You know, what, what sort of future would we like to see? And that led me on to realizing that actually, I do try to do these things with um, our young students, you know, mostly undergraduate, I would say. Um, and there really is a lack of experience and a lack of confidence amongst them in terms of that imagination, that creativity that some of you have been talking about, you know, that envisaging of how do we even think outside of the accepted norms? How do we think outside of what we um, just currently experience? You know, so, so stepping out of that box is really what was coming into my mind a lot while I was while I was reflecting on what you were saying. And and yeah, I suppose just um, a sort of appreciation of the global south conversation as well as part of this discussion so yeah thank you very much you've you've really made me feel much less isolated within my own sort of attempts to bring this um you know climate change and sustainability agenda into my own sort of small small sphere of influence so thank you very much for that absolutely fantastic could i maybe just bounce on that one really quickly if you don't mind colleagues um because again i, I mean Sometimes I do come across as quite politically opinionated, and but I also do come from a business background as well. I've had my own business. And I've been lucky to have been involved in businesses that have had different attitudes and approaches to the models that they operate, the ways that they operate. Like Stephen said, we know how to do this. We can't actually do this using different ways and, and means of going about it. And I think the same applies to economics, um, but seen from a different position. I think looking back in my career as a designer, what was perhaps missing was that notion of storytelling that you suggested, Stephen. It's that, how do you tell the story of this different curve? Because all the stories I was telling was of exactly the same curve, but just with a different color or a different something else. And I think that for me is the shift that we are making just now with the way that we're trying to move the design curriculum uh, at the Open University, is that shift to actually designing the curve a little bit more. And I don't mean deterministically, I don't mean you're determining the, the shape of the curve, but you're helping people see that. And I think part of that is about that story and it has to be about everything. It can't be about just a single position. It has to include the economics, just as it does the resource, just as it does the social sustainability of any setting. And that Agenda 21 stuff, well, I've said this before, Emma, those headings did matter. 
Um, you don't get sustainability unless you you look at the whole um, the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I, I, I personally, and I think there is a lot of there's a lot of potential and, uh, for optimism and uh, economic creativity too. But we need as much creative disruption in that sort of environment as anything else. And well, Matt might jump in here and add to that, perhaps. Go on, bring bring on the love, Matt. A little bit of optimism. That's what we're looking for at the in the. the Dying. No, I'm feeling optimistic. Generally feeling optimistic. I mean, I was, I was, I was just going to say that, you know, I've, I've made plenty of mistakes, like all of us, and I've done some, good, I've done some good things, and I've done some less good things. Well, I've made me some, some mistakes, some howlers, and um, things which I did get right is I think that sustainability manifests in places. I think it's situated. I think that's really important. I think space, place, and sustainability that that goes together really nicely. But I have spent a lot of my time working with extant systems and powers and structures and working with incumbents. And I am tired of some of those things and trying to get small changes there among the powerful to try to bring about this brilliant need. And I recently read a paper in Energy, and it's not a plug, it really isn't, I don't care less, in Energy Policy uh, about electric vehicles just merely further embedding automobility. And when actually, and it's making us blind to the deep structural changes that I think we require. So the thing that does like me and keep me up at night is how can we become more sustainable within the current structures and systems that we have? Is it going to be a complete revolution, breakdown and revolution, or do we have an opportunity to radically change now? And I think the agenda was very clear there in 1975. And now the are again talking about the same sort of stuff. Where is it going to go? Emma. Good, good question. Where is it going to go? I'm. I. I would like to say that I'm. Um, I have to be hopeful because um, why would I be in this job if I wasn't always hopeful? And I think um, I'm very excited about design growing up and being the discipline I know it can be, <laughs> and and beyond the discipline boundaries that perhaps it's rooted itself in um, today and you know, like Anne, how, how we have these broader conversations where we know that a lot of disciplines and are, are going through similar pains or thoughtfulness and mindfulness around change. And we need to find better ways of, of creating those opportunities to come together, to, 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 to jam together, to, to get different solutions and different outcomes. So I think um, the OU is one place and then there are many more, but I'm really... I'm really thankful for the colleagues I have and for the conversations I have daily in, in really, um, I think, moving the, the agenda forward. And I'm very excited about the new design qualification and how that will hopefully capture a lot of these narratives and stories, and particularly from people like Alessandra, bringing in um, very different perspectives. It's so, it's so important, so important to be a better listener as an as a educator and I really hope we can we can do that justice. Any final comments from others? I know we're at time. There's an um, an, a post um, going on in the chat. If you look at the chat, and Robert is um, agreeing with Derek about critical pedagogy, and and I would also second or third that that um we do all, all too often say education it's as if it's a sort of um you know panacea education or it needs more education that's that that's the answer well we're actually, we've, had, we've had quite a lot of it and um look where we are so is that you know is that is that it is that the answer i'm not i'm not sure it is um no i think that i think that's where i mean be lovely maybe we could do another follow but then on yeah. critical pedagogy on its own um but you know, that's there's so many methods that we don't even come close to trying um, in the higher education space. Sorry, Robert, did you want to jump in on that? And yeah, you can't speak to talk. How are you doing? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can I do. Yeah, go for it. 
Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I'm really, really fascinated by all of this and actually just been marking this year's um, Design Thinking Students of Warwick and the graduates and realising that this, there is a gap. There's something we're missing in getting them to think about the uh, designing for societies, for people, people relating to each other in specific ways and thinking about how they could be designing for different kinds of societies and also how they could be designing to change societies. Uh, and the critical pedagogy thing comes into that in that how we um, organise the classroom and beyond with the students demonstrates that we can do things in different ways. We don't have to just fit in with the institution or follow habit. And actually, we can be critical and reflective about our relationships with each other. Yeah. That's been a big thing this year because I think the students, their kind of expectations and their habits of learning have been disrupted. So there's been a kind of open opportunity to uh, get them to actually you know, reflect and think differently. And some of them have done really, really well at that. Um, which is great to see. Well, we, we definitely need to catch up sometime. You'll need to come down and we'll, 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 I know we, we keep emailing and talking about this. We'll need to get together and talk about it. We're, literally today, we're talking about how to almost uneducate, to re-educate, and how we might actually really radically break those paradigms. Um, and it's a fantastic challenge. But, you know, as Alessandra said, you know, we're now in the space of requiring radical. So, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, 1971. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect last words. Fantastic. Okay, thanks. Well, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending tonight. It's been um it was it's been really valuable even just getting together with colleagues to think about this event. And I hope we'll have um more conversations with more folk. Um, as, as the months unfold going forward, um, you know, time is of the essence, as they say. So just to thank everyone for all their efforts and um, look forward to, to future conversations.